Thanks for checking out this week's message. I hope that it's helpful for you wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Here at Restore, we are a place where anyone can have a seat at the table and everyone can experience the extravagant love of Jesus. So I hope you walk away from this message knowing that you are deeply loved by God and that you can be fully loved by a church community. And if you don't have that, we would love to connect with you here at Restore. You can go to restoreaustin.org to find out more. (laughs) That is the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. Yay, when the sermon's about to start. Wow. Oh, get ready. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one after that. Um, uh, now, many of y'all know um, I have uh, two sons, and um, we were also actually foster parents for a few years, and we had three other sons during that time. Um, but I don't talk about them much up here in the sermons, and there are really two main reasons for that. Number one, they are their own people you know, with their own lives and their own faith journeys. They're not like props for me. Um, And I know how damaging it can be when pastors make their children into props for ministry. Um, And so that's a big reason, reason number one. Reason number two is that not everyone here is a parent, right? And being a parent or not being a parent is incredibly complex. There are some of us who want children but have struggled to conceive or meet someone to build a family with. Some of us have lost children. Some of us have children, but have difficult relationships with them. Some of us have difficult relationships with our parents. It's just a complex thing. But this morning, our story from Scripture centers on a father and a son in a way that kind of really affected me personally as I prepared to preach this week. So if you'll permit me, I'm going to talk a little bit about what being a dad has been like for me. When our oldest son, Judah, was born... I fell in love with him in a way that I didn't know was possible. When I held him for the first time, I felt this myriad of emotions, but the most unexpected one I felt was fear. I remember thinking, why am I so afraid of this tiny baby? (laughs) But I quickly realized I wasn't afraid of him, I was afraid for him. I was afraid of the responsibility that I carried as a parent, as his protector, his guardian. And if you've ever loved someone, whether you're a parent or not, who was completely reliant on you for support and help, you know that feeling that I'm talking about. You would do absolutely anything to make sure that they are safe. I also remember getting ready to leave the hospital with Judah the day after Amy gave birth. We were 25 years old. He was one day old. (laughs) And I could not believe they were actually going to let us take him home (laughs) with us without any adult supervision at all. (laughs) I brought it up to the discharge nurse, and she was like, you'll be fine. But I did not believe her, my friends. One time, when Judah was four, we were at one of his soccer games, and I was holding our youngest major, who was just a a baby at the time, and Amy was keeping our current foster placement, our son, uh, busy, who was a toddler. Now, a few minutes into the game, Judah scores a goal. And he is so excited, right? He scores, he turns, and he runs back down the field with his arms in the air, doing a little dance like he is so excited. But then a kid on the other team ran up behind Judah and pushed him in the back as hard as he could. Judah never saw it coming. He went down immediately in a hump. Before I knew what was happening, I was halfway onto the field with baby major on my hip, ready to defend Judah from his four-year-old assailant. (laughs) Thankfully, I quickly realized (laughs) how ridiculous I was being. I was so embarrassed, actually, that I put major down on the grass and then picked him up again really quick to be like, oh, look, he just crawled out onto the field. That's why I'm out here picking up a baby not to fight a four-year-old. That's, (laughs) nobody would do that. That's ridiculous. But my guess is that if you're a parent or a caretaker of any kind or somebody who has just felt that fierce love for someone else, you know why I ran out onto the field. As absurd as it was, there is something in us that drives us to protect the people that we love at all costs. And I think this is especially true for children in our care. Now, sometimes that drive gets messed up you know, due to trauma, mental illness, or other things, but I honestly believe that fierce, protective love that we have is given to us by God. 
But here's my question for us this morning. What would you do if God was the one that your child needed protection from? What would you do if God told you not only to step aside from your role as protector, but actually commanded you to harm your child on his behalf? That's the subject of our story today. We're a couple of months into our year of Bible stories for grown-ups, and we're working our way through some of the most well-known passages in Scripture and stories with the goal of interpreting them in ways that lead to Christ-likeness and a healthy community and flourishing for absolutely everyone. And we're doing this, right, because so many of these stories have been weaponized in ways that have really hurt people, really confused people. And the story we're looking at today is one of those stories. It's commonly called Abraham and Isaac. And it's found in Genesis chapter 22. So you can turn there if you want. In a minute, the verses will also be on the screen. You can follow along there. But before we start reading, I want you all to know that this is not an easy one to interpret. Last week, we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah, and I made the statement that like, this is not complex, actually. This is pretty easy to understand. There's another passage in Ezekiel that literally lays out the interpretation for us. This is not one of those really hard to understand ones. Today, it is. It's one of those really complicated ones. In fact, rabbis, pastors, and scholars from both Judaism and Christianity have been trying to figure this out, tossing out interpretations for thousands of years in a myriad of different ways. Walter Brueggemann, who's one of the leading Old Testament scholars in modern history, puts it like this. This narrative holds rich promise for exposition, but it is notoriously difficult to interpret. Its difficulty begins in the aversion immediately felt for a God who will command the murder of a son. And I have to confess that I feel a strong aversion for this God who commands a father to murder his child. But is that what really happens in this story? Is that really the God that we believe in, that we gather under his name every week? I'm not so sure. So let's dive in. Genesis 22, starting in verse one. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now, pause for a second. After these things is a very important phrase here. It's meant to indicate that we should understand this story in light of what Abraham and his family have been through up into this point. So if you don't know what that is, I'm gonna give a quick overview. 10 chapters ago in Genesis 12, Abraham meets this God, Yahweh, for the very first time. It says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. So God promises to bless the whole world through Abraham and his family. God also promises to give Abraham and his wife numerous offspring that result in them becoming what he calls, quote, a great nation. There's just one problem, though. Abraham and Sarah are old at this point. They don't have any kids yet, and Sarah is past childbearing age. And so they're struggling. How is God going to fulfill this promise? So Sarah decides that Abraham should sleep with her slave, a woman named Hagar, in order to have a child. Hagar conceives and gives birth to Ishmael, but Sarah quickly gets jealous and tells Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael away. And Hagar and Ishmael actually have an incredible story of their own that our executive pastor, Lindsey Contreras, preached two weeks ago, if you want to go back and check that out. But after they leave, Sarah ends up getting pregnant and giving birth to her son named Isaac. Now, I tell you all of this because I want you to understand just how difficult it was for Abraham and Sarah to have Isaac. And they loved and cherished him all the more because of this fact. So when verse one says, after all these things, that's what it's talking about. It wants us to understand the depth of the issues that Abraham and Sarah have had in order to conceive Isaac. So verse two, then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, 
He took, him, he took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. And we had cut enough wood for the burnt offering. He set out for the place God had told him about. I'm always struck at this point in the story by Abraham's response to this request from God. He doesn't protest. He doesn't even ask questions. He just goes to sleep, wakes up the next morning, sets off to kill his son. It's wild to me. This is yet another reason why it's so important to interpret the Bible in context, because we know from the past 10 chapters of Genesis that Abraham has repeatedly shown a willingness to argue with God, to protest, to ask him for things. You were here last week. We talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember what happens at the beginning of that story? God says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And, he, and Abraham's like, no, no, my brother-in-law or nephew, Lot, is there, right? Like, don't destroy it. If you can find 50 people there, 50 righteous people, don't destroy it. And God's like, okay. And then remember, he like negotiates. Well, how about 40? Okay, how about 30? And they get, he gets God all the way down to 10. You can find 10 righteous people. It's like a whole section of scripture. Abraham arguing with God. But it doesn't happen here. Why not? Well, Abraham is from a place called Ur of the Chaldeans, which I know sounds a little bit like a planet on Star Wars, but it's actually in modern day Iraq. And when God calls Abraham to leave that place and follow him a few chapters earlier in Genesis 12, the passage doesn't really say much about what he's leaving behind. It just says he went, right? But a few verses later on in the book of Joshua, we actually get some backstory about what's happening here. Here's what it says, Joshua 24, one through three. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. Okay, remember that one, worshiped other gods. But I, the Lord, took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, the nation grew. This is the history of the people. Abraham used to live beyond the Euphrates River and he used to worship other gods, plural, gods. Abraham's family of origin worshiped other gods. And it's not like Abraham was a kid when God called him in Genesis 12. He was 75 years old. We know that from the text. Abraham spent the first 75 years of his life worshiping other gods. And we know from ancient Near Eastern history that most of these other gods were violent, vindictive, and demanding. If you were here when we kicked off our year of Bible stories for grown-ups back in August, we read a lot about these other gods from these other religions' ancient texts and origin stories. Remember the, the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Atrahasis Epic and all of those things. We read about these gods. These gods sent natural disasters when they got angry. They indiscriminately killed people. And they constantly tested the allegiance of humans by demanding things of them. Do you know what one of the things they demanded from them all the time was? Child sacrifice. All the time. If it was like hadn't rained in a while, child sacrifice. If it had rained too much, child sacrifice. If the gods were angry, child sacrifice. If the gods were hungry, child sacrifice. This was a common thing that was done inside of these other ancient Near Eastern religions. So for Abraham, sacrificing his son was not an abnormal request from a god. He doesn't even plead with God to change his mind like he has done so many times before. Abraham assumes that this God is like the other gods that he worshiped for the first 75 years of his life. And following this God means being willing to sacrifice his child. So that's what he prepares to do. Verse six, okay, we're gonna read through this whole thing now. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? <sighs> you imagine that moment there? Like Isaac starting to realize what's happening. You know, he's starting to get some understanding of we have every other element for this sacrifice except for the animal that's supposed to be sacrificed. Abraham answers, God himself 
will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out from him, to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram, and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, as I said earlier, this story has been interpreted in a myriad of ways in both Judaism and Christianity over the last couple of thousand years. One popular rabbinic interpretation is that Abraham actually failed this test because God wanted Abraham to argue just like he had done before. He wanted him to protest. He wanted him to push back. Another common interpretation on the Christian side is that God was testing Abraham's allegiance to him. The application that I've most often heard from this story usually goes something like this. Abraham was willing to do anything for God, including kill his own son. We need to be like Abraham and willing to do absolutely anything for God too. Would you nod if you've heard something like that from this story? Okay, almost all of you. That's the one that I've been most often taught growing up in church. But let me just say, I find <laughs> that interpretation and application incredibly problematic. Some of the worst atrocities in human history have been committed because someone believed or claimed to believe that God told them to kill someone else, right? Think about it. Some of the worst things that we have ever seen. This is the background of Nazi Germany, right? Hitler, the Nazi party, claimed that God had told them to distinguish, extinguish the Jewish people. Right? This was true of the Crusades, the Inquisitions, so many things. Manifest destiny in the founding of the country that we now stand in. They believed that God told them to wipe out the Native Americans in order to give them this land. Some of the worst things that humans have ever done have been because they believed or claimed to believe that God told them they had the power to kill someone else. So let me tell you about the interpretation I find to be both most consistent with the context of this story and the character of God. I believe this story is God showing Abraham that child sacrifice is something that he does not demand or even allow. This is God calling Abraham and everyone else who would follow God, including us, to an ethic of valuing every human life equally of moving away from these practices of child sacrifice, of moving away from understanding gods as being retributive and violent and angry and asking for human sacrifice all the time and moving us toward this God who loves and cares for all people. We see this a little more directly spelled out a little later on in the story. This is in the law that God gives his people in Leviticus let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire. That was a huge part of this Levitical Deuteronomical law that God gave to his people. This is not who we are, God says. This is not what we're about. I love how Rob Bell talks about this story. He says, this isn't a story about what Abraham does for God. It's a story about what God does for Abraham mind-blowing, new, groundbreaking. So back to our original question, what kind of God would ask a man to sacrifice his son? Now, an answer, not this one, not this one. Testing allegiance by requiring child sacrifice is what other gods did, not this one. Demanding that humans be killed in their name is something other gods did, not this one. Now, most of us are not facing a decision of whether or not to sacrifice our children as burnt offerings. But I know many people 
including some of you in this room who have been told that you need to choose between God and your child. Not long ago, I had coffee with a couple who had experienced something like this. Years ago, they had been deeply invested in a fundamentalist church when their 21-year-old son told them he didn't wanna go to church anymore. And he was having a lot of trouble understanding the Bible. He was having serious doubts about God and they didn't know what to do, right, this couple. So they went to their pastor and asked him for help. Their pastor told them they had to lay down an ultimatum for their son. Either he puts away his doubts and returns to church or he is no longer a part of their family or God's family. The pastor told the parents they needed to choose between God and their son, just like God asked Abraham to choose between him and Isaac. They were telling me this story, and the wife says, after praying and wrestling for weeks, they sat down and prayed and told God, we love you, but we choose our son. And I said, I can't imagine how hard that must have been, y'all. What was that like? And through tears, the mom replied, it was so hard, but the moment those words came out of my mouth, I felt the presence of God all around me, and I felt him say, I never asked you to choose between me and your child, and I never, ever will. I never will. Rachel Held Evans once wrote a blog about the story of Abraham and Isaac called, I Would Fail Abraham's Test. (laughs) And in it, she wrote these poignant words. Get your son, get a knife, slit his throat, set him on fire. I'd like to think that even if those demands thundered from the heavens in a voice that sounded like God's, I'd have sooner been struck dead than obeyed him. I would sooner turn my back on everything I know to be true than sacrifice my child on the altar of religion. God didn't ask Abraham to sacrifice his son on the altar of religion, and God is not asking any of us to do that either. I believe this story demonstrates quite the opposite, in fact. God shows Abraham and all of us by extension that no matter who they are, where they go, how they navigate their spiritual journey, God does not ask us to choose between him and our children. I think this story is most beautifully depicted in the story of the prodigal son, right? This thing that Jesus said, you wanna know what God's like? You wanna know what the kingdom is like? It's like a dad who when his son went away, stood on the top of a hill and waited every freaking day for him to come back. Every day. And as soon as he came back and he was one sentence into an apology that he had rehearsed, the dad interrupts him, hugs him, kisses him, puts the ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, welcomes him back into the home, to the family, to the inheritance, and throws a party for him. You wanna know what God's like? Jesus said, that's what God's like. God is not asking us to sacrifice our children or ourselves or anyone else on the altar of religion because God does the sacrificing because there's something else happening here in this story and I wanna bring us to a close by showing you what it is. Remember back in verse seven when Isaac asks his dad where the sacrifice will come from? He says, Father, the fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Do you remember what Abraham says? Verse eight, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And what happens? God does. God provides. So much so that Abraham actually names the mountain the Lord will provide. Some traditions believe that this is the same mountain that God's temple would eventually be built upon. This story doesn't just turn us away from child sacrifice. It turns us toward the fact that God is our great provider. We break things, God fixes them. We sin, God sacrifices. We are in need. We are wondering where the lamb is gonna come from. God provides. As Christians, we can look back at this story through the lens of the New Testament and see the foreshadowing of Jesus all over it. It wasn't a lamb that God ended up providing that day. It was a full-grown ram caught by its horns. But the lamb would come later. 
Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, began his ministry on earth by walking up to a guy named John the Baptist and asking him, can I be baptized by you? Do you remember what John says when he sees Jesus walking his way? John 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God. The narrative of scripture is not the story of humans laying their lives down for God, but God laying his life down for us. Take that with you today, my friends. But Jesus didn't stay dead. God in the flesh was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices because he overcame death with life and he rose from the grave and he now offers that life to absolutely everyone. As Paul so beautifully wrote to the first century church, God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead too, along with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united. We are one, literally, with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. My friends, this is the true character of our God. A God who loves us so much that he put on flesh and came to earth and laid his life down. A God so rich in mercy and love that he raised us up right alongside the risen Jesus. Other gods demanded human sacrifice, but our God sacrificed himself for humanity. That is the God that we serve and that we worship and that we gather here under his name. Let me pray. We're gonna close with a song. Lord God, we are so grateful that you are a God who provides. That just like Abraham and Isaac stood on that mountain where you said you will provide, God, that we now stand on the earth where you continue to provide for us. That you are good, that you love us so much that there is nothing you would not do, nothing you would not sacrifice, including yourself in order to be united with us through your love. I pray that every time we are tempted to sacrifice ourselves or our kids or someone else on the altars of religion, that we would remember that you already sacrificed, that we get to live in the fullness of your resurrected life, Jesus, and that we get to just be purveyors and distributors of your great love and mercy and hope. Make that true of us, God, as individuals and as a church family. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.